Okay, so our next uh, speaker is uh, Andy Yu from the University of Oxford and is going to talk about, raise a question, are diagrammatic proofs legitimate? Just a second. Andy, you want to use the clipper? Oh, the microphone. Uh, yes, so thanks uh, so to all the organizers, Andrea and Jessica, this sort of conference has been great fun and I've learned a lot. Um, just before I start, I should say that um, yes, also the, the title is different from originally advertised. Um, also, there is too much information on the slides, so I won't um, talk about everything that's on the slides. Um, I'll just focus on the important points. Uh, so, Okay. So my talk is on uh, diagrammatic proofs and whether they're legitimate. Uh, the kind of basic, basic, hopefully modest claim is that sometimes I think they can be legitimate. Um, just to start off with some background, um, diagrammatic proofs famously appear in Euclid's Elements. Uh, it was used as a textbook in mathematics for about uh, 2,000 years. Um, so they were kind of uh, well accepted as parts of uh, mathematical proofs, uh, but recently things have changed. Um, I think these days people often tend to think that diagrams don't have a proper role to play in proofs. Um, at best, they're just pictures that can help illustrate things, um, uh, but they're not really legitimate parts of proofs. Um, so, just to give an outline of this talk, I'll start off by saying a bit about what proofs are and why uh, we want a proof. Then I'll talk a bit about the received view, which criticizes diagrammatic proofs for being too unreliable, uh, too particular, and unable to be formalized. These are the three main objections I have. Um, then I suggest, in the second half of the talk, that with a more charitable approach, um, diagrammatic proofs arguments don't look so bad, and this is partly substantiated by uh, some work that um, Luma or Mama has done um, on the formalization uh, of Euclid's uh, diagrammatic arguments. And then I close with some thoughts on whether we can really draw this uh, distinction between verbal and diagrammatic arguments, which um, for most of the talk um, I just assume. Um, is a fine distinction to draw. <laughs> so, just the basic thing I'm trying to so just to say a bit about what I'm taking diagrammatic proofs to be, um, just kind of by analogy with verbal proofs, um, their arguments, deductive, um, and sound. So, um, in the same way that we have verbal arguments that are um, sound, necessarily sound, um, also might have diagrammatic arguments that are necessarily sound. Um, there's a type of a diagrammatic. Um, you might want to press me on what a sound argument involving diagrams are. Are diagrams true? Um, I'm not sure I can really explicate that in too much detail, but hopefully this kind of analogy with verbal arguments helps. Um, this thesis is modest for three reasons. So one, um, I'm not saying that uh, diagrammatic arguments have to be parts of proofs, just that they sometimes can be. Some diagrammatic arguments are valid, some are invalid, just like any other argument. Uh, diagrammatic arguments also need not by themselves constitute proofs. I'm not just saying you can just appeal to a diagram and uh, there we have a proof, just that even if they play a small role, but an essential role in the proof, that's good enough. Um, and then third, uh, diagrammatic arguments um, don't have to be parts of proofs for particular claims. So you might have some claim, um, it's no part of my claim that you have to use a diagram in proving some claim, just that there might be a proof out there uh, where a diagram plays an essential role. Um, so just to say a bit about what proofs are and why we want proofs, so 
probably the most important goal, or the most important goal is to show that a given claim is true, but also a closely related one is to show why uh, a given claim is true. So this is a proof play this kind of important epistemological role. Um, and here often we have multiple proofs for the same thing. For example, this claim that uh, 0.99 recurring is equal to one, there are various proofs of it, um, some employing algebraic techniques, some employing techniques from analysis, and so on. Uh, very often it seems like um, proving the same claim in different ways, giving different proofs for the same claim is very uh, illuminating. Um, what does it take for an argument to be uh, part of a proof at a minimum? The argument is, should be deductive. Um, also, oftentimes these days, uh, people kind of assume that arguments uh, at least are formalizable, even if they're not uh, purely formal. In principle, they can be made formal, um, and that's what makes them rigorous, uh, acceptable. Um, and the second point here is just similar to the one on the previous slide. You might have uh, different proofs for the same claim, uh, each giving us uh, some insight into the claim. Um, now I want to make this distinction that Hardy makes between informal proofs, formal proofs, the formal proofs are the official proofs of um, mathematics, um, and we have a precise definition of what these proofs are like, the strings of symbols, um, uh, we might have you know, a bunch of axioms, and uh, every string is either an axiom or uh, as, or obtained from the axioms by um, applications of inference rules. Um, but these proofs very rarely occur in mathematics. Usually these are, um, it's, it's kind of ideal that uh, um, these are Pinkibia Mathematica style proofs that people rarely employ. Uh, most actual proofs are just informal proofs, proof sketches. They give you the basic idea. And then um, the thought is that uh, proof is rigorous and legitimate um, if they can be formalized. Uh, and that's why most uh, proofs that occur in textbooks and so on, even though they're not written in this principial style way, way are still acceptable uh, because they can be made formal. Um, so now I'll talk a bit about the received view. Um, again, so for 2,000 years, Euclid's Elements this is this mathematical textbook. Diagrammatic arguments, proofs were uh, accepted. Uh, but beginning in the 19th century, uh, they kind of lost their prestige, became viewed as imperfect, lacking sufficient mathematical rigor, and relying on a faculty of intuition that has no place in mathematics. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, kind of uh, axiomatizations by people like Clash and Hilbert. Um, uh, for example, in Hilbert's axiomatization of geometry, these were viewed as corrections or improvements um, to uh, Euclid's uh, arguments. So, the received view is, uh, is uh, that diagrammatic proofs aren't legitimate or that diagrammatic arguments can't count as proofs. Uh, that's mainly because they're not formalizable. Um, they're not formalizable, uh, as I'll go on to say a bit more about in a bit. Uh, they're not formalizable because they're too, uh, they're too unreliable. Uh, at best, this is not to say that diagrams have no important role to play um, in helping us understand mathematical claims. It's just that uh, they're at best these heuristic devices uh, that help us understand claims, uh, but maybe once they've been proven by other means, uh, but they themselves can't count as a proper part of the proof. Um, so either they must first be corrected or improved upon, um, and then translated into verbal arguments to earn legitimacy. But even then, uh, the thought is, uh, it's not the diagram itself that's doing the important work, it's the translation um, that's doing the important work, and that's the real proof. Um, this is the received view. We'll go on to uh, uh, discuss some quotes. So here is Leibniz. Geometers do not derive their proofs from diagrams, though the expository approach may, may, makes it seem so. 
It is universal propositions, definitions, and axioms, and theorems which have already been demonstrated that make up the reasoning and they would sustain it, even if there were no diagram. So the idea here is that this diagram is not essential. Um, Here's Pash. The process of inferring must be independent of diagrams. In the course of the deduction, it is certainly legitimate and useful, though by no means necessary, to think of the reference of the concepts involved. If it is indeed necessary to so think, the defectiveness of the deduction and the inadequacy of the proof is thereby revealed, unless it is possible to remove the gaps by modification of the reasoning of views. So again, the idea here is that if the proof is making a kind of essential uh, appearance in the proof, then something has gone wrong. Uh, we have to fix it in some way. Um, here's uh, Fomenko. It happens rather frequently that the proof of one or another mathematical fact can at first be seen, and only after that and following the, following the visual idea can we present a logically consistent <coughs> formulation, which is sometimes a very difficult task requiring serious intellectual efforts. And again, the idea here is that the, uh, the visual idea, some diagrammatic uh, or visual uh, illustration is playing this kind of uh, inessential role to proof. And here's Hilbert. Nevertheless, be careful, since it, the use of figures, can easily be misleading. Um, again, the idea here uh, is that uh, proofs should play no essential role. Uh, diagrams should play no essential role in proofs, because they can be misleading. Um, and then I just extract um, some points to take to be central to the received view. So one main criticism is that diagrammatic arguments are unreliable. Um, so Klein cites the diagrammatic proof that all triangles are isosceles to substantiate this criticism. Um, so of course, um, we don't want to depend, we don't want to make, uh, to prove general claims by relying on uh, specific features of uh, particular diagrams. Diagrams can be misleading. Um, Another kind of example that uh, has been cited is that, um, so you might think after having drawn many curves using a pen and paper or on the whiteboard, that continuous curves can fail to be differentiable at only a finite number of points since we can only ever draw a curve with finitely many jagged corners. Um, but as uh, uh, Weierstrass has shown, there are uh, there is a continuous but nowhere differentiable curve which shows that uh, Continuity does not coincide with differentiability. So again, the thought just is that it can be misled, misled by diagrams. The second criticism is that diagrammatic arguments are too particular. So there's this general, there's this claim uh, that one plus three plus five plus dot 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 plus two n minus one uh, added these odd numbers. Uh, is equal to n squared, so and there's a diagrammatic proof of it that people have talked about. So if you have a dot here, and then you add three dots, and then you add uh, five dots, uh, and then there's a question as to whether this uh, is a proof of a general claim. Um, some people think it is, some people think it's not. Um, you might think that uh, diagrammatic arguments are too particular because, okay, fine, this shows that n equals three case, but it doesn't show that n equals uh, the general case where n is any number. Um, so at best, diagrammatic arguments can invite us to draw analogies or serve as deductive arguments for more general claims, but they can't really by themselves be proofs of general claims. So this is the second criticism about diagrams. Diagrammatic arguments are uh, too particular to kind of demonstrate general claims. Um, but there is also reason to think that, uh, well, partly given that diagrams have this important role to play historically, um, you might think on the one hand, okay, now we are just more rigorous in the way that we do mathematics. And of course, that is true. Um, one line you might take is that. Uh, and uh, it's right that we now reject the legitimacy of diagrammatic arguments and proofs. Um, they aren't really, they can't be legitimate. But another line you might take, that Abigail, for example, takes, um, is, the, is that, well, the fact that these diagrams played an important role historically 
um, and that mathematics has been practiced for thousands of years, it's not just a recent invention, suggests that, well, maybe you might be even more charitable. Uh, so let's explore some attempts uh, by uh, people to, to kind of defend the legitimacy of, our, of diagrammatic arguments. So one attempt is due to Barwise and Etchemendi. So, okay, there's a rather extreme view that Peirce has, or had, where almost all diagram, all, almost all arguments, including logical and mathematical ones, are diagrammatic. It seems a bit extreme, so I'm taking it that most people will deny that most proofs are diagrammatic. Um, a less extreme view, um, due to Barwise and Etchemendi, is that diagrammatic arguments and proofs can be important not just as heuristic or pedagogical tools, but as legitimate elements of mathematical proofs. Um, of course, just that, just because diagrammatic arguments are sometimes unreliable doesn't mean that they're always unreliable. Um, so we can grant, find various other people who have criticisms of diagrammatic arguments. Um, we can grant them that, yes, some of these, um, in some of these examples, they're right that um, the relevant diagrammatic arguments don't really constitute proofs. Uh, because there are gaps in them, they're too unreliable, and so on. But this doesn't mean that all diagrammatic arguments um, uh, are going to be un unreliable. And Barwise and Etchemendi appeal to this proof, uh, what they refer to as a diagrammatic or visual proof of Pythagoras' theorem. Uh, and they claim that uh, the diagrammatic argument employed represents the claims that they're about. Uh, by exhibiting some kind of structural similarity. So a good diagram is isomorphic or at least homomorphic to the situation it represents. Um, and then they take this visual proof of Pythagoras' theorem to show that uh, there are legitimate diagrammatic proofs out there. Um, but there is reason to be unhappy with their uh, defense of the legitimacy of diagrammatic arguments. So they use these phrases like one easily sees um, that a given argument is clearly legitimate or is a legitimate proof. Um, and you might think that uh, the sorts of things that they say uh, aren't going to persuade us about the legitimacy of diagrammatic uh, arguments or proofs. Um, these are some criticisms that uh, Dennison makes. Um, a second attempt due to James Brown, um, maybe he I think, has this idea which um, I quite like and I think uh, gets something that's right, uh, although it's not the full story. The basic idea is just that although proofs might be, all proofs are it might be visual in some respect. What matters isn't kind of what they strictly look like, uh, but what they represent. Uh, the way he puts it is that all proofs are mere stepping stones that guide us towards this kind of aha moment where we see that a claim is true. And he, he thinks that this is true for verbal proofs as well. So this is a special feature of diagrammatic proofs. Um, here's a quote from uh, Wittgenstein. The figure of the Euclidean proof is used in mathematics is just as rigorous as writing because it has nothing to do with whether it is strong well or badly. The main difference between a proof by drawing lines and a proof in writing is that it doesn't matter how well you draw the lines or whether the R's and L's and M's and E's are written well in the first to figure. This is perfectly all right. It really is a prejudice that these figures are less rigorous, partly because the role of such a figure is mixed up with the construction of a measurable pentagon. Mixing up drawing used as, uh, as symbolism with the drawing as producing a certain visual effect. Um, so the kind of underlying point here, which I think is right, is that it's not what the diagram kind of strictly looks like that matters, but rather the thing that it represents. Um, and then, uh, so this is a point that uh, Brown presses. He himself is a Platonist. He has this, uh, uh, puts it this way. Some pictures are not really pictures, but rather are windows to Plato's head. Uh, he, so he agrees that um, a diagram by itself might just, so for example, this proof of the claim that I mentioned earlier, might just kind of strictly speaking represent the n equals three case. 
but in some kind of gen more general or broader sense, it represents the general case as well. Um, and he uh, draws two analogies. Uh, so one analogy is uh, with representation in aesthetics, in which something uh, represents something as a picture. Uh, but also represents something else as a symbol. The basic idea here just is kind of the distinction between denotation and connotation. Um, just this idea that uh, a given inscription might strictly represent something, but in some broader sense uh, represent something general. Uh, a second analogy he draws is with uh, this distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic features, so uh, such as curvature and arc length, uh, we might represent these things using various coordinate systems, using polar coordinates, or using standard uh, coordinates. Um, but the idea again is that we are, we're after something. Although we might be employing a, a certain representation that's particular to a certain language. Um, the thing we're after is representation independent, and that's the thing that we should be focusing on, not just, not just the representation. Um, so Barwise and Etchemendi and Brown um, kind of, uh, aren't so skeptical about the legitimacy of diagrammatic arguments, but there's reason to think that they, but that neither of them are really going to convince the skeptic. So Barwise and Etchemendi's attempts attempt fall short in that uh, uh, one of their criticisms of their kind of argument is that uh, some of the diagrammatic arguments they claim are proofs that essentially involve diagrams don't, in fact, seem to essentially involve diagrams. Uh, and then a problem one might have with Brown's attempt is that it appeals to this Platonic heaven in mind's eye. You can see these general claims in the mind's eye. Um, and these notions might seem unclear at best or mystical at worst. Still, this doesn't mean that all attempts to defend the legitimacy of diagrammatic proofs are bound to fail. This point that Wittgenstein and Brown make seems quite important that it's not the represent the thing that's doing the representing that matters, but the idea that's being represented, that's the thing that matters. Um, and then, of course, the poorly dry, drawn diagrams are no more an obstacle to proof than bad handwriting is and verbal arguments. Um, there's a third attempt by uh, Ma, uh, and he gives uh, his PhD thesis intuition formalized. He gives a formalization of Euclid's arguments, uh, some, many of which involve diagrams. Uh, and he employs, employs this distinction due to Kenneth Manders, uh, which I'll talk about uh, in the coming slides. So this distinction is between uh, what Manders calls exact and co-exact properties. Exact properties are relations between magnitudes, lengths, areas, angles of the same type. Co-exact properties are certain relations between uh, these magnitudes, between the so-called exact properties, the regions that they define, points of intersection, and so on. So one example that uh, Manders uses is that uh, consider uh, triangles. Of course, there are various triangles that have different lengths, different sizes. Some are equilateral, some are isosceles, and so on. But all triangles, no matter how you draw them, if they're triangles, are going to have angles that add up to 180 degrees. And this is something that we can prove using a kind of diagonal argument. Um, and the kind of crucial point is that diagrams might vary with respect to their exact properties. Might be They might have lengths of different sizes. Some triangles are isosceles, some are equilateral, and so on. Uh, but diagrams don't vary with respect to their co-exact properties in that the existence of certain in intersection points, uh, the location of certain points and regions don't vary. 
to some things vary among particular diagrams, some other things don't vary, and then you can kind of see where this is going. We want to rely on the things and the properties that don't vary um, across diagrams mm -hmm. if we want to use diagrams uh, to prove, to convince ourselves of uh, these more general things. Um, so what's important is that diagrammatic arguments uh, don't rely on these exact properties, um, that they're very careful and rely only on co-exact properties uh, or separate verbal arguments. And this view seems to be quite consistent with what Euclid himself does, especially when proving seemingly simple claims such as the, dry, the, such as the triangle inequality. If you could thought that you could just draw um, inferences as you like from particular diagrams, you could have just you know, drawn a particular circle and said, um, uh, to demonstrate that the triangle inequality holds. This isn't in fact what he does. He goes into great pains to show uh, some apparently simple claims in this kind of step-by-step -step careful way. And this suggests that Euclid himself was uh, had this kind of distinction in mind, uh, that he was uh, conscious of the sorts of uh, properties that you could and couldn't rely on in diagrammatic arguments. Uh, So, I won't go into the details, but Mama gives a formalization of Euclid's arguments which uh, he takes to be faithful to Euclid's arguments, so he isn't kind of spotting Euclid too much. Um, and he uh, formalizes diagrams um, just by having a kind of a bunch of points and then lines in between them. Uh, these are diagrams that he represents in this formal system that he gives. Um, and then atomic claims have a diagrammatic component and a verbal component. And then he gives a formal system uh, for proving claims uh, that involve diagrams. Uh, this, this is all in his thesis. It's 200 pages. It's very complicated. Uh, but it looks like it works. Uh, so again, I won't delve too much into the specifics. Um, but the basic uh, point is, uh, if MoMA's project is successful, and it looks like it is, um, this worry that we had earlier, that uh, diagrammatic uh, arguments uh, are not formalizable, uh, is just shown to be wrong, because uh, it shows that we can formalize uh, diagrammatic arguments. Um, so I don't have time to go into some of these slides, so just uh, going to my closing thoughts. So there are these three objections. So first is the unformalizability objection. So this just shows to be uh, wrong. This is shown to be wrong by uh, formalization of Euclid's arguments um, in this formal system. The unreliability objection uh, doesn't seem that compelling. Again, of course, we can find that some uh, diagrams are going to lead us to error. They're because they're unreliable. But this isn't to say that all diagrams are going to do this. Uh, I think the most serious objection is the worry that diagrams are too particular. So you might accept that, for example, this diagram proves, again, proves the n equals 3 case, but it doesn't show the, the general case. Um, but it seems like we rely on this distinction that Manders has between co-exact and exact properties, and are careful uh, about the sorts of inferences that we're making. Um, then uh, there's reason to think that uh, even though sometimes we only seem to be appealing to particular diagrams, uh, we can establish general claims as well by relying on these co-exact features that are kind of invariant across uh, particular diagrams. And then a kind of important closing thought, um, which uh, referee for this paper has pressed me on, and I would like to thank him order for that, because I think it's a very good point, and one that I'm very sympathetic to. Um, so for, throughout this talk, I've kind of assumed that there's this distinction, clear-cut distinction between verbal arguments and diagrammatic arguments, uh, where these diagrammatic arguments are kind of unreliable, too particular, and so on. Um, 
by verbal arguments are. Uh, but there seems to be a discussion as to whether we can really draw this distinction, whether this distinction is really all that clear cut. Um, here's the reason to think that the distinction isn't so clear. What words and diagrams have in common and what matters is that they're inscriptions. Of course, there's some uh, 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 they're representing things in some way, and so they represent tours. And, uh, so the inscriptions, whether it's uh, marks on the page, words, or diagrams, uh, but they represent something. They represent some content. If the contents of sentences or propositions, as many philosophers tend to take them to be, then arguably the contents of diagrams can also be propositions, or things like propositions. Uh, and this is because propositions aren't linguistic items, they're something more like abstract uh, items, things, uh, uh, representational content. And there's no reason why diagrams can't be the same thing in principle. Um, but if this distinction isn't ten tenable, uh, as, for example, Ian Quinto also seems to suggest in this book that he has in 2007, uh, this would seem to lend support to the view that diagrammatic proofs are or can be legitimate. And at least there isn't this clear cut distinction between um, diagrammatic arguments and verbal arguments. Uh, if this distinction between them can be can really be, be maintained, um, then uh, objections uh, to the effect that diagrams are unreliable or too particular and so on, at least in principle, apply equally to verbal arguments. Um, so again, the basic point just is uh, there is some kind of medium of representation. It might be words, might be pictures, diagrams. Um, but what matters is what's represented, uh, and verbal arguments can do this just as well as diagrammatic arguments, and conversely. Um, still, it is interesting that uh, there is this distinction between diagrams and words, at least some kind of intuitive, dis dis intuitive distinction. Uh, they're phenomenologically different. Um, this, most people will say, is a diagram. Um, what's on the slide, most people will say, um, the words, verbal. Um, and also maybe they involve different cognitive abilities as well. Maybe different parts of the brain are involved in processing diagrams, uh, processing words. Um, just to briefly conclude, um, diagrammatic proofs like verbal proofs, it seems, can show that things are true and why they are true. Uh, like verbal arguments, they're formalizable, um, can give us some kind of insight into claims. Um, uh, and Mama's formalization of Euclid's argument shows that they're formalizable. Uh, nonetheless, the distinction between verbal and diagrammatic proofs or arguments is so clear cut because there isn't this clear distinction between what counts as verbal and what counts as diagrammatic. And I'll just go for the next slide. Um, if you look at a modern mathematics book, uh, you will find either pictures that are clearly just illustrations, or there's one place where diagrams are used as parts of proofs, namely category theorist diagrams where you chase arrows, right? Yeah, now, in the category theorist diagrams where you chase arrows, it is obvious that the diagram can be replaced by uh, a, 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 a derivation in, in symbols and words of the ordinary kind, right? So in modern mathematics books, there really aren't diagrammatic proofs except for the category theorist ones which are clearly removable. Now, it seems to me that the reason for this is very simple. It's that modern mathematics has a structuralist or axiomatic method background according to which you're proving something from clearly stated axioms for a clearly specified uh, set of structures. Now, the trouble with diagrams is that you don't know what the premises are, or rather the use of diagrams. I mean, the famous example, Euclid 1 1, where you bisect a, a given segment of a line by drawing two circles, and uh, you're, you're building in there axioms about continuity to get exactly two intersection points of the cir circles, and the diagram doesn't tell you what the premises of the proof are. It seems to me that uh, unless you can make clear what 
premises a diagram is using, they're ne never going to have a use in modern maps. Yeah, so I think that's a fair point. I think uh, the point you're making is kind of much more uh, powerful, uh, though, if I were claiming that uh, there are arguments out there that just rely on diagrams and nothing else. Um, uh, because, like you say, it's not clear what premises we're employing in diagrams. Uh, but I think it's enough for my claim uh, that there be, so it's perfectly fine that we start out with premises that are formulated verbally, but maybe somewhere uh, later on in the argument, at some point we appeal to an argument, um, and it, uh, to a diagram. And, and as long as that diagram plays some kind of essential role uh, in a proof that uh, the resulting thing counts as a diagrammatic proof. And it might be that to convince yourself, if you're, if you're kind of still skeptical of diagrams, to convince yourself you, you want there to be or need there to be this kind of translation mapping between the diagram. Somehow you need to convert the diagram into something verbal before you're uh, convinced. And I think this is the mindset that most of us have today. Um, uh, and if you just deny that diagrams can ever really have this essential goal on their own, then there's nothing I think I can say that can really convince you otherwise. Um, but at least it's good enough um, for the claim of this talk that uh, diagrams can play even this very minor role uh, as a part of a, uh, of a diagrammatic argument. Mm -hmm. and, yes, so, so, so it's just the first a uh, quick point about EU that's going to lead into something else. So EU's inconsistent is the big issue. Okay. I don't know. Uh, can you, can you use an app? Yeah, sure. So EU is inconsistent. Nathaniel Miller has shown you he's inconsistent. I think there's some dialogue <laughs> as to exactly um, you know, ways of performing it and things between them. And yeah. So is it inconsistent because Euclid's thing is inconsistent? No, 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 no. Or you it's fine, it's, okay. it's the system EU that's inconsistent. But I mean, I'm so confused as to why, or, I mean, there's a big tradition of formalizability, but the practice of mathematics is seemingly, to me, the bits I look at, quite informal. So could you just say what's pumping this desire to just formalize everything the whole time? I mean, for sure, formalization is really useful, but what, what's driving the desire to formalize absolutely everything the whole time in the context? Yeah, so that's a very good question. And uh, I mean, I think that kind of what largely explains this is this kind of historical thing that I mentioned that in the 19th century, I think, kind of really largely due to these people in the 19th century, people formalizing. You know, there's this move towards formalization. I mean, mathematics has always been practiced. Um, it is somewhat misleading to say. I mean, it's easy to have this picture where Mathematics, as you know, as we know it today, didn't really exist until 200 years ago. Um, but it would just be wrong to think that, math, you know, what the Babylonians were, were doing or what the Greeks were doing wasn't mathematics. Um, I mean, what's driving this kind of urge to formalize uh, arguments, proofs? Um, so I think uh, there are various reasons, and I mean, oftentimes these were very good reasons. Um, where uh, in the 19th century and sometimes earlier, people would you know, point out various uh, inconsistencies with concepts that we had, whether they were with um, numbers, uh, real numbers, and so on. And, uh, you know, uh, people had problems about the calculus until it was really, you know, as we would put it today, put on a firm footing uh, by people like Budokan and Marshas in the 19th century, um, even though it was done several hundred years beforehand. Um, what's kind of pushing this drive for formalization is this kind of, uh, you know, we want our proofs to be kind of gap-free. They're supposed to be, um, they play this important epistemological role. We want to be absolutely sure that a claim holds. And there's this kind of dissatisfaction, I think, with informal proofs or informal arguments. There's this kind of feeling that, uh, I'm not 100% convinced unless you can show me that. Um, uh, at least I think this is the kind of uh, maybe mindset or attitude that many people have might have today, kind of implicitly. Um, unless a given informal argument or proof can in principle be formalized, um, it's not really a proof. Um, 
And like this example that was mentioned earlier with uh, this proposition 1-1 one, one in Euclid's elements where it tries to show you can construct an equilateral triangle from a line uh, drawing these two circles and then Russell pointed out that uh, Euclid was implicitly relying on this axiom of continuity that you can make um, explicit. So for these sorts of reasons, um, I think um, people don't want to fall into the trap of believing a claim that's false um, and informal arguments are much more likely to make us kind of to convince us for uh, to convince us uh, that a claim is true uh, when there might be these gaps uh, in the argument or various hidden assumptions that haven't been made explicit. I would like to say all that. Okay. No, I, I, I apologize. I just can take one question and it's going to be Mark. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think that there is a, a big misunderstanding. Because one thing is to set up an argument that is the mathematic as we look at some dark and bears, we can say it in general. Another thing is to say that then the dramatic argument is a proof or can be part of the proof. And whether it's possible or not of this thing. This depends on the theory which you are. It's just not a question that you can answer or formulate in general. In 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 the context of Euclid, the geometry as is done in the element, of course, not only is uh, uh, the use of argument is legitimately improved, but it's necessary. In other contexts, the using diagrams is absolutely not acceptable. It is dependent on the, the way in which the ontology of the theory is done, the way in which the, the theory is constructed. So the question is not whether we can use a diagram, diagrammatic argument to give proof. Of course we can, but in certain theories. And so we have to constitute the theory in such a way that we can. And in other theory, of course, we cannot. So the point is to go to see the theory as it is, to look attentively to the theory as it is, and to see whether in this context we can use the diagram or not in order to be proved. Sometimes the answer is yes. I try to give this answer for okay, the geometry is a very careful analysis of the way in which okay, geometry works. In other theories, the answer is no, we cannot. Yeah, so I think what I've said in this talk is compatible with what you're saying. Uh, so I, it's a very weak claim, and I think maybe you were thinking, you know, you were saying, well, of course we can use diagrams and proofs. Um, I was attacking a, a kind of more radical opponent who, uh, or responding to a more a radical opponent who thinks that there isn't even one case in mathematics where a diagram is an essential goal. So if there's even one case, and you seem to be conceding that, um, this was obvious in the case of um, the arguments that Euclid uses, that's good enough. But there's a more radical kind of person out there who thinks that there isn't even one case where a diagram is acceptable because it's not formalizable or it's, diagrams are too particular, too unreliable, and so on. Okay, thank you.